Salutations, everyone. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm just realizing right now this is my first face cam video with the new hair. You're probably wondering, what's going on, Maddie? You look so beautiful with your old hair, my beautiful boy. What happened? And to answer your question very quickly, my Twitch community decided to do an 80 sub train and get me to 250, which I thought was unfeasible. And I said, yeah, I'll dye my hair at that point. Well, they proved me wrong, and the rest of the story is on my head. More importantly, we're dishing out hot takes. And these hot takes, they make it so toasty, you gotta back off your computer mind monitor your phone screen wherever you're watching this from you might have to sit back because we got the s tier a plus a b plus b c plus c meme status they published this and never played this game so i'm going to be putting together every single published bethesda game from 1995 onwards into a list this is my own personal tier list i'm really nervous about the comment section but anyway uh well, let's just get started so we got elder scrolls legends at the beginning i'm gonna put this one at be. Now, I would have ranked this a little higher because I love card games. I play Dragon Ball Super, the card game. I play Magic the Gathering and in turn play Magic the Gathering Arena. I thoroughly enjoy both those games. I'm actually trying out the Final Fantasy card game. So I like card games, if you couldn't tell. And Elder Scrolls Legends bothers me because when you are offline, you cannot play this game. So you have it on your phone and sometimes I want to chill and play it. And when I have a disconnect, I lose all my progress. So I can't even play single player by myself. This was when I was trying to play it last summer furthermore the, the game just didn't click with me i liked what it was going for with the two lanes but i never liked that style of gameplay it seemed to be something that tried to stand against hearthstone but do its own individual thing and i think it does it well i just never got caught up in this game whatsoever and i also got smushed by the competition but i know there are a lot of viewers of mine who enjoy the hell out of elder scrolls legends especially some patrons so i'm sure they'll be very disappointed to see i'm already putting this at like an average spot next is Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners... What? Yeah, they, they published a Call of Cthulhu game. I had no idea, but I looked it up, and it was a survival horror game that apparently starts off in the first few hours. It's pretty strong, but afterwards, they, they give you a gun, and it just goes to shit, and there's a couple of game-breaking bugs in there. And so, I have never played it, so I can't rank it super low. Based off what I saw, it was, it was very, very bad. But, um, it, or it had that promise, rather, and it failed miserably afterwards. And so, it became even worse than bad. And, um... Yeah, I put it in that they published this category just because th this is a game I, I never even knew Bethesda touched. And, and that'll be a common theme throughout this. You're going to see a couple of games that you're going to wonder, wait, when did Bethesda publish that? Next is Brink, though. And this is one of those games from Bethesda that a lot of people like to defend. Some have just said it's the worst published game from them. And I personally put it in the... I never played it. I watched the reviews. I saw the bugs. And I thought to myself, I have no desire to play this. This isn't a hidden gem to me that I'm like, you know, one day I want to go back to Brink and actually give it a fair shake. No, I'd like the concept, you know, parkour and team shooter, all that stuff sounded great. But I mean, on, on the execution, it just did not turn out well, did not look appealing. I did not want to play it whatsoever. And so, yes, that goes in the never played category. I know some out there will be like, just give it a try. But no, I'm good. I'm good. Does not look appealing to me, and I'm, I'm standing by that. Next is Elder Scrolls Daggerfall, which, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the first two Elder Scrolls games, I have never played them. So yes, Daggerfall looks fantastic. I, I really like the idea of it, and watching documentary-style videos on that game has always been fascinating, where it makes me want to play it, but I gotta sit here and be honest with my tier list. I've never played Daggerfall. Uh, but from what I saw, it would probably rank in like the A or B plus area just based off sheer scope and scale and role playing elements. It, it looks like an awesome game. It's just one I never got around to because I fell in love with Elder Scrolls a different way from other people. A lot of folks got to remember I'm in my early 20s, so I, I was not really around. I was I was as I was a baby at the point. I think I was a year old when Daggerfall happened. So uh, just keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that I, I had no chance of playing Daggerfall up until around this time where I could probably comprehend it. Next is Dishonored Death of the Outsider, which I'm going to put at a B. Plus, I really liked Death of the Outsider quite a bit. I thought outside of Dishonored 1, Death, Death of the Outsider had probably the best story. And I thought it really wrapped up the Dishonored lore, where now that we know the series is on ice, 
I think it's okay for it to be because this game really concluded a lot of things and, and made me feel great about the series. It left a good taste in my mouth. Obviously, the gameplay elements were excellent. It was priced fairly. I thought it was replayable in a sense, um, even though I stripped out some of like the karma system from the game. But I still really liked what was offered here. And uh, it was a six hour adventure, so I thought it didn't overstay its welcome. It had clearly a purpose of telling a good story and it did that. And so it's not like the best Dishonored game by any means, but I think it was a really good one. And so I do rank it in the B plus area. Next is Quake Champions. Now, this is gonna be interesting because Quake is not something I have a lot of experience with, but Champions, I do have a decent amount of hours in. Last summer, my boy and I played it together. And I'd put it in, I'm gonna say B plus. I enjoyed Quake Champions a decent amount. Um, the only issue I really had with it was at times, it could feel a little imbalanced because some people would play as, I believe it's BJ Blazkowicz and he would dual wield anything. So you could get special weapons and dual wield them and he would just shred the lobby. Um, but I love the skill ceiling. I love the gunplay, the mobility, how fast paced it was. The map design was excellent. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's free to play. Element was great. I ended up buying the $30 pack to get access to everything. And I thought that was money not wasted. I, I really enjoyed it. And as I got better with the game, it felt good. I could see the hook in it and why people spend dozens and dozens and hundreds of hours on the game. But for me, I, I, I didn't end up continuing on with it just because it didn't have its claws in me. But overall, as a game, a multiplayer only game, it was one I spent a decent amount of time with last summer and I did enjoy all that time spent with it. However, one game I did spend probably more time with is Dishonored 2. Now this will be interesting because Dishonored 2, ladies and gentlemen, had a really buggy PC launch, but it falls in the category of games that are also on this list that I didn't experience the bug written launch everyone did. I got a review code for Dishonored 2, I played it, and I really enjoyed it where I'd put it at, yep, A tier. I thought Dishonored 2 was a really, really good game. And like I said, my experience was not marred by bugs, by bad performance, I played on the PC. But I really liked in Dishonored 2 how you had two protagonists and they played completely different. You don't see that nowadays in games and I thought that that was a risky move in today's industry. Also being a stealth game, you already had, you already had stuff working against you there. Um, they were working with a lot of unpopular elements when it came to sales and critical acclaim and I thought they did an excellent job with it. Obviously the story changes a little bit based off who you're playing as, I thought that was awesome. I thought the way that they handled the dynamic elements in the world and how big the world space was, but yet how much freedom there really was to explore everything. It was dense and rich, and I thought it was a worthy follow-up to the excellent Dishonored one. So I personally love Dishonored 2. I've done both playthroughs for both Corvo and Emily. I thought they were both very enjoyable. But next is Dishonored 1, which is going to be our first S-tier game. Dishonored 1 is the best Dishonored. I thought this was easily one of the best titles Bethesda's ever published. I think Dunwall is an incredible setting. I thought it really had some interesting lore packed into it. I love the gameplay elements. I've replayed this game at least five times. Each time it felt completely different. The level design is spectacular and I think it's because unlike Dishonored 2 where things open up a lot more, Dishonored 1 is a lot more focused because its areas narrowed down a bit more. But even for its time back then, Dishonored 1 was very wide open to explore. Lots of buildings to enter, albeit it came with an additional loading screen or two, but I thought it was a worthy trade-off because everything felt a lot more concise and focused. Furthermore, I thought the story was intriguing, the premise, and then the DLC that they built off of with Dishonored 1 really fleshed a lot of things out and made it an even better experience. So Dishonored 1 easily sits up there at one of the best published Bethesda games and probably one of my favorite stealth games of all time. If you have not played it and you want to be a supernatural assassin, this is the way to go. I also thought it was intriguing, especially at its time, how you could actually have your ending change based off how you play the game. So if you were killing a lot of people, then you would have the bad ending. And if you were going ahead and trying to save people, spare them and not take a brutal route and your powers would match up with that, you get a completely different ending in that way too. And I thought that was really a cool touch for a game that just had to focus on its gameplay to be good and its exploration, but it did everything exceptionally well. Next is Doom 3 BFG Edition, I believe it's called, and that's going to go in the C, the lowest rank we can really give it, next to meme status. It wasn't so bad, in my opinion, that it was meme status. I remember when I was younger and I was in high school, and I didn't really have an income at all, I'd go to GameStop with $80 I'd spent weeks and weeks ago, and I'd just buy a plethora of used games, 
beat them and return them and just give them the reason that I'm returning them is I didn't like them. And it really worked out well. Let me keep playing games from the industry without having to constantly spend $60. I was just recycling that same amount. I'm probably one of the people who contributed to GameStop's downfall. But anyway, Doom 3 was one of the games that fell into that category, also along with a couple of others. But anyways, Doom 3 was a game that I, even as like during the days where I would only play video games, I'd skip my homework and play video games, I would go ahead, eat dinner, come back, play video games, like I'd always be playing video games endlessly and doing nothing else, Doom 3 was a game I slogged through, I did not really enjoy it much, I thought it was an okay game at best, uh, I thought once again it kind of represented what we read about with Call of Cthulhu where it started off somewhat intriguing and a little eerie, but over time it, it just fell apart. Um, and I, I felt it didn't really resonate with me on what I associated Doom with because my first experience with Doom is right here with Doom 1, which I will rank at a B plus. This was a game I actually experienced for the first time on the Xbox 360, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and that's why I believe it's, it's fallen onto this list. Once again, I, I did not create this list, but I would put Doom 1 in the B plus category because it's, it's an original first person shooter. I thought the concept of it was awesome. It was a relic of the past. And so the way I experienced it as, as a teenager and going back to this game that really started a lot of things for the industry, it was a cool experiment that, that paid off. And I thought it was really fun. There was something fluid about it that uh, is really hard to capture in games nowadays. And, and while it has its kinks and its flaws, I did enjoy it for, for what it was. It was it was simple, arcade-like fun. Uh, but what was even more fun is Doom from 2016, which we're gonna put in the A plus category. Oops, I almost slipped up and dropped it in the S. A lot of people were like, yeah, man. oh, he, oh. Yeah, so why is this in the A plus and not the S tier? I feel like I gotta explain that because so many people freaking cream their pants over Doom. My answer is just this. Doom is an excellent game. It has pinnacle level design, amazing gunplay. It's the best feeling gunplay since another game on this list. But ladies and gentlemen, Doom 1 was just a bit too long in my opinion by like four or five hours. I, I was done with it much earlier than I expected it to go on. And since there wasn't much else hooking me in, I just didn't get grabbed as deeply where I was so in love with every minute of that experience. I know a lot of people love the 16 hour adrenaline fueled adventure, but for me, I was done by 12. But otherwise, that's a minor complaint. A plus is great, ladies and gentlemen. Don't freak out because Doom is one of the best published titles, probably in a lot of people's opinions, the best published title Bethesda's ever put out. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought the exploration was really good for this game. It, it brought me back, man. Like I was so shocked by the single player campaign because everyone thought Doom would be a multiplayer centric game and it did have a strong multiplayer mode although it died off very quickly which was sad because I thought Doom's multiplayer should have really taken off that was a fun aspect and I think underrated alongside snap map which was really cool if you go back and play some of the snap maps there's endless replayability in Doom 2016 but more than anything is the shocking single player story that was there and was dense was rich I mean there was a bulky codex in there that put a lot of other games that are our story focused to shame. It, it was like, what? This is Doom. But anyway, it's progression, the amount of upgrades you got, the toys you had to play with. I enjoyed it. And to tack on to what I was mentioning about the game going on too long is I liked how they kept giving you rewards over and over, which is why I fell in love with Rage 2 so much. But eventually the rewards stopped and then you were just playing with those toys for, I thought, a bit too long. But look, I get it. It's an unpopular opinion. I just want to let everyone know how I felt about it. Now, while I played the Doom 2016 in the original Doom, I did not play Doom 2. So I can't really say much on it. I'm sure I'd like it given my, my enjoyment of these two Doom games. But yes, Doom 2 was the title I never played. More interesting to me is Ducati Moto on the Nintendo DS. They published this? What? What the hell is this, Bethesda? I got, oh my god, Ducati Moto. What? All right, so this is once again another game from Bethesda that I guess they published during their dark days where you just wondered what the hell they were doing, putting out the likes of Rogue Warrior. But yeah, Ducati Moto was a game. I feel like I should do a Let's Play of that at some point in time just because that's that's hilarious. Like picturing Pete Hines at the business table going like, yeah, Ducati Moto could really bring us in some extra revenue. Let's publish this DS exclusive moto bike racing game. This is what we've got to do. All right, anyway, next is Elder Scrolls Arena, which, uh, like I said, we've got to put it in here, and I'm going to go ahead and just 
cut it short a little bit by throwing in Battle Spire as well. Some of the older Elder Scrolls games, I have not taken the time to get into just because, like I said, I fell in love with the franchise in a different way. And so therefore, I have not had the opportunity to explore these older ES games, but I am sure they are great. I think out of all of them that I've thrown in here, Daggerfall appeals to me the most. I know Battlespire looks neat. All of them look neat, honestly, in their own ways, but I think Daggerfall looks the most appealing. But I just wanted to get that out of the way while they were all lining up on the list. However, an Elder Scrolls game I have played quite a bit of that I enjoy is Elder Scrolls Online, which, oh, here we go. It's an A-plus in my book. <laughs> oh, man. How could you rank Doom in the likes of Elder Scrolls Online? Look, Elder Scrolls Online would be S-tier, but its first year was fucking horrendous, and I did not care about this game until Tamriel Unlimited happened. But ever since then, Elder Scrolls Online, hands down, bar none, has been the best maintained MMO on the market, no questions asked. Tons of DLC, tons of community interaction, tons of fixes, Oh my god, it's amazing, and the stories there are great, the questing is great, the gameplay is great. One Tamriel update was the best addition to the game, so someone who has been playing the game for a while could get their new friend into it and they could experience content together. This game is the leader in the MMO market as far as I'm concerned, I'm sure WoW Classic might have something to say about that, but I love Elder Scrolls Online. I have been an avid supporter of it, I was one of the people who did not believe in it early on, and I gladly ate my words because this this game has turned into something special and fantastic and kudos to a team for taking an idea that no one really thought would work and making it work. There's a game on this list that I wish had the same type of effect but it just doesn't. I'm sure you can guess what it is but Elder Scrolls Online man it is a really really fun game and it offers a lot of replayability as they're adding a ton of new classes to the game so I thought this was an easy A+, plus just from a content standpoint. Also bang for your buck Elder Scrolls Online goes on sale all the time. I've seen the gold edition, which includes like five DLC packs and Tamriel Unlimited, go on sale for $20. That's like 500 hours of content. That's all pretty good for $20. I just, but anyway, on its own without price accounted for, Elder Scrolls Online is one of the best games Bethesda has put out. I'm sorry, it, it is. You can't argue it. But I think what we can all agree on is Fallout 3 being an S tier. So Fallout 3 is in my top three games of all time. It's KOTOR 1-2, it's Fallout 3, and then it's Persona 4 Golden. So Fallout 3 is up there, man. I may have a little bias on this one. I want this game to be remastered so, 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 so badly. I cannot deal with it any longer. And it makes no sense why it hasn't returned. But anyway, Fallout 3 really set the standard for the industry when it came to open world games when it came out. It's an interesting story for me too because this is a game I did not like when it first dropped, but now I am in love with because I've played it so many times. I mean, the music, the world space, the story, the characters, the replayability to some extent. I love the atmosphere of this game. It just, oh mm, my God, it, it was Bethesda Game Studios really at the best, at the top of their game. I mean, they went from Oblivion in 06 and went to Fallout 3 in 08, and those were two top tier games, and they're like, yep, we just did both of them exceptionally well. But Fallout 3 is a special case because there are some timeless moments, of course, going into Tenpenny Tower, watching Megaton blow up from miles out, stuff like that cannot be replicated in other games. Those are moments that will forever be in gaming history, and I think Fallout 3 is one of the most special games ever released, so that is why it sits in the S tier. Fallout 4, it's follow-up. Oh boy. So Fallout 4, for me, is going to sit in the B+. I would have ranked this in the B, but after I have played it for my Road to Platinum series that I'm working on, I've realized that while Fallout 4 is not the game that a lot of us wanted it to be, I think that this is a title that has some pretty good characters, some really cool moments, some great ideas it plays with, fun gunplay, excellent exploration to an extent, it just lacks the role-playing elements, and but in turn we get some really good voice acting, and that's what happens, is a lot of the series identity was sacrificed to make Fallout 4 the game it was today, and I think it still is quite enjoyable, and I do recommend folks who maybe have a sour taste in their mouth after experiencing so many games in the years, 
go back to Fallout 4, give it another whirl, maybe you'll enjoy it a bit more because I feel like it's aged a little better in certain respects. There are still the frustrating aspects like going to a really unique location and just finding an audio log and going, but there was so much more potential here. This is disappointing. That still happens. That does not ever go away. But I just think Fallout 4 is a enjoyable game at least. On top of that, I think it's DLC while most of it, bleh, I think that Far Harbor is one of the best pieces of DLC Bethesda has ever done and it being a part of the Fallout 4 package I do have to account for that which raises it a little bit more. I think Far Harbor really shows that Bethesda Game Studios can still make excellent role-playing games they're just choosing not to. Far Harbor had everything choice and consequence accounting for special stats interesting quest lines cool atmosphere a nice world space it, it had everything that we've wanted from BGS games for years so there's still a little beating heart left in that part of BGS. They just need to channel that into a full game. Hopefully Starfield is that. But anyway, Fallout 4 sits at a B plus right now for those reasons. 76, welcome to your first entry in the meme status. Fallout 76, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> a game that all of us so desperately would have loved to have enjoyed. Fallout with friends, it could have been in the story with Elder Scrolls Online, you know, a game that went against all odds and showed, hey, here's this great idea. No, the gamers don't believe in it, but we're going to prove you wrong. Fallout 76 has yet to prove us wrong, and the only talk I see of it is in conversations comparing it to the worst of the worst. 76 was the most broken launch. It was a game that shattered a lot of my trust in my favorite developer of all time and in turn has made me concerned for their future. 76 has had some nice updates here and there, but they have never really restored it to a point where it is a game worth recommending. It has never received that overhaul like in Elder Scrolls Online where it has a bright future. 76, I wonder if it will eventually get all of its DLC, and hopefully down the line when we have the Wastelanders expansion, maybe 76 will be out of the meme status. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, it says a lot when I, who really enjoys Bethesda games, flat out drop this game, does not cover it at all, completely moved on from it for the most part, and has just said, you know what, this game isn't for me, let's talk about something else. I've been very fortunate that you guys have followed me to those other games, but I think it says a lot when I'm just like, yeah, piss off, I don't want to play your game. Anyway, next is Fallout New Vegas, which, yeah, of course, S tier. Fallout New Vegas is one of the best role-playing games ever made. It comes from Obsidian, published by Bethesda, and while that relationship may be a bit rocky, it does not matter because the game itself is fantastic, and a lot of us would like to see Obsidian take another crack at the Fallout franchise. It really channels everything that needs to be in a Fallout game nowadays. Of course, Fallout 3 introduced the open world element, the first person shooting gunplay, but New Vegas took that and then put a full on role playing game on top of it. While Fallout 3 had role playing elements and some choice and consequence along with the karma system, it was more of a role playing game than most previous BGS titles. I think that New Vegas properly took those systems and made a reactionary world around you where you could miss content based off certain choices people would have relationships with you and like and dislike you and it felt like a game that shaped around your choices made and there was a lot there and while i don't really like the world space all that much you cannot argue the fact that new vegas has really interesting and deep choice and consequence and in turn makes the world space all the more interesting because of that because these characters are living there fallout shelter is gonna sit in the the beats here this would have been a b plus because i thought fallout shelter was a fantastic mobile game but as the years went on bethesda kept adding microtransactions that ruined the game like the nuka cold quantum which added a questing system that forced you to wait fallout shelter made tons and tons of money by being a fun game and just that but bethesda wanted more and the way they pushed that was by adding mechanics and tying in microtransactions Pardon me, this game's making me a little sick now because it makes me upset that, ladies and gentlemen, they could just go there with this game. With that said, though, I can't erase the, the year or so of great memories with Fallout Shelter. From the way it was announced, to the actual title itself being fun, to constantly playing it, waiting for Fallout 4, to even after Fallout 4, playing its fun updates, Fallout Shelter was a really good time, and it showed that Bethesda Game Studios has potential as a mobile developer, and they also showed that with Blades, which we'll get into later in the video. But anyway, Shelter, really enjoyable game. Would be in the B plus area, but I feel like, yeah, those microtransactions, man, they, they just can't do that. 
Next is Haunted a Demon's Forge, which we're gonna put at a C plus. Welcome, you are the first C plus. Simple but sweet here. Like the idea, not the best execution. Uh, nice co-op story. Uh, could be enjoyable, but uh, for me, it just didn't really resonate deeply with me and nothing more to say on that. So Morrowind, this is interesting because I have not played a ton of Morrowind. I've played it over and over in the terms of starting up uh, playthroughs and, and chipping away at it, but I've never fully completed Morrowind. However, I really like what's there and I know what Morrowind means for Bethesda Game Studios. It saved their studio and it did so much for the industry, more than probably most games on this list. And so for that, ladies and gentlemen, out of a sheer act of respect, Morrowind has to sit in the S tier, in my opinion. While I haven't experienced the entirety of it, I do have to say that what I have played was excellent. My only issue is such a childish one. I just can't stand that when I swing my sword, I, I swing through the enemy because my skill isn't high enough. And as you get higher up, then you start connecting with the enemy. But there's just this disassociation between the gameplay and the skill system there. And it doesn't work well with my brain. But despite all of that, the writing, the exploration, of course, exploration is a key theme, if you can tell. I love good exploration in games. But also, I, I thought that the intro in this game especially is timeless. And I think it's because I was a kid when I first experienced Morrowind, and I've done that intro dozens of times, just because there's something about it where you get dropped off in a little town. It's not like a lot of these Bethesda Game Studios games where you exit an area and you're above the world space and you can see from a vista everything you can explore. Morwen's like, yeah, you're in a little town, St. Anine, and have fun, man, and, and you go off onto a road. And it's like you're literally dropped smack dab in the middle of an already existing world rather than the game setting you up and saying, look at all what you're going to explore. This is going to be an adventure. It felt very natural. It, it sucked you into the world in a, a neat way that you don't see quite as often because it really made you feel like the world was much bigger in its own way. So anyway... Morrowind has a really fantastic introduction, great gameplay elements, great skill system, uh, and there, there's just a lot packed into this meaty package. So that's why it's just at the S tier, and we're just going to keep slapping games into the S tier, I guess, because Oblivion is going to go in there as well. Pretty much any BGS game from 2011 and prior is going to be in the S tier. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, Oblivion is a game that, as these steps go on, Morrowind, Oblivion, Fallout 3... Look, these were all introductions for someone somewhere, and for me, my introduction to BGS was Oblivion. This is one of my favorite games ever made, uh, sheerly because it, it brought me to a developer I love to death. Technically, you could say Morrowind was, but I was too young to know what the hell was going on, but Oblivion, man, I just remember being wowed by its open world, its combat at the time. I know the combat's not good now, but the, the combat at the time, uh, the amount of quest lines there were, the amount of guilds you could join, it, it was just really mind-boggling. And actually, recently, I went back to replay Oblivion for a 2018 review, which is on my channel. And on top of that, I had actually got the last two achievements for this game to, to make it 50 out of 50. And so that was a pretty cool moment for me. But even after that, I looked at the map and went, holy smokes, there's like 300,000 dungeons lying around for me to explore. And while some of them were cookie cutter because they only had one dungeon designer, I still thought that Oblivion at its time was a really marvelous, mind boggling game. It, it was substantial in scope. I'd imagine even back then, I played this when I was in eighth grade. And once again, that was during a time where as a kid, I was just always playing games. I, I'm sure I didn't even scratch the surface on everything that was contained in Oblivion, but, you know, of course, that Dark Brotherhood quest line, fantastic stuff. Uh, it's just, what they have in this game is really good. Some, some monumental moments like most BGS games. Pirates of the Caribbean. Hmm. Wow. They published that, too. So, look at that list. Call of Cthulhu, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Ducati Moto. This is why we have the They Published This category, because I'm sure as this video has gone on, you've, you've been like, What? What, ladies and gentlemen? What's happening? Yeah, so Pirates of the Caribbean was published by Bethesda, and I, I guess that's a thing that happened, but what we can relate to more is Prey. Prey, I am going to put in the A tier. Another Arcane Studios game making it there. I thought the level design in Prey was probably some of the best, if not the best, that Arcane Studios had ever created because a lot of their gadgets and weapons, like the glue gun, would allow you to scale their environment and their environment actually enabled that type of exploration where it wasn't encouraged but it allowed you to do it they're like yeah you can get to this area in the game that you're supposed to get there technically in the middle but you can get there now early on and just explore if you want 
I thought that level of freedom was really enticing. On top of that, a pretty neat story in Prey. While I thought some of the choice and consequence was faulty and the ending was really frustrating, I cannot forget one thing that is the expansion for Prey, Moon Crash. Oh man, I liked Moon Crash more in the base game. While the base game was excellent and there was a lot to love about it, Moon Crash did procedural generation right on a AAA level. It really brought the gameplay to life in this new way because it was arcade feeling, but also it made sense why you were chasing down all the loot and why you were surviving and in this loop. I just really liked what Moon Crash did with the Prey universe. It felt like a natural expansion of the lore. But back to the base game a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. I just have to compliment them on the amount of tools and gadgets they gave you and how open the space station was for you to explore. And based off how you played the game, enemies would respawn or not respawn. I, I thought all of that was interesting on top of engaging your Typhon abilities or not. It had a lot of elements that Dishonored had that made that title strong as well, which is why Prey is one of the better titles that Bethesda has published. Quake Arena, never played it. Quake something, I never played it. I, I told you guys when I was going into Quake Champions, I've never experienced Quake that much, so maybe you're looking at the B-plus Quake Champions rating and going, that's way too high, Maddie. Well, maybe this answers it. I've never played these two Quake games. Rage 2 just came out, and let me tell you what, this is where some triggers might happen. Rage 2 is S tier. Rage 2 is one of the most fun games I've played. Now, I think the conversation around that decision will be, why S tier for Rage 2 and why A plus tier for Doom? Because Rage 2 shares that fast, explosive gunplay that Doom has, but Rage is set in an open world while Doom is more linear. So Doom manages to sustain pace a lot more where Rage has those moments where you can breathe. Now, it's really up to preference. If you like the adrenaline moment to moment, constantly going action where you wanna go into shooter arena to shooter arena, Doom will probably be more up your alley and put it in the S tier for you. For me, I like the open world. I love the vehicle combat. I love the interesting biomes in the world, the variety and the moments where you could take it down a notch, breathe, sell your junk, collect some bounties, buy new schematics, that type of stuff. I enjoyed the break from the gameplay. While some thought, I just want that gunplay to be sustained. I thought the encounters in the open world, the activities that were there, made it where it was okay that there was a break because there was so much going on in those gameplay segments. But anyway, Rage 2, like I said, one of the most fun games I have ever played. I cannot emphasize that enough. I don't care if the story's bad. I don't play the game for that and the game wasn't meant for a story. They literally put you in the open world in 25 minutes. If a game wants to tell you a story, they're not going to do that. Sorry. That's just how it is. And so Rage 2, man, S tier game, one of the best games Bethesda has made. Rage 1, however, interestingly enough, Rage 1 rated higher at the moment than Rage 2 across the board on Metacritic. I'm going to put in a B plus tier. I really liked Rage 1. I, I thought it was a hidden gem. I thought it introduced a gritty dark world and in tone Rage 1 and 2 are completely different and I may make a video just comparing these games now that we have Rage 2 in our hands. But Rage 1 had some awesome co but Rage 1 has some awesome customization, albeit a really weak ending. <laughs> but outside of that, I enjoyed the vehicles, the vehicle combat. Uh, it, it was kind of creepy at times. It felt like a good in-betweener game in 2010 when we were right in the middle of Fallout 3 in New Vegas. This, this felt like a game that fit well. And it was also during a time where, unlike Rage 2, which I think some folks will knock it down for, is that Rage 1 came when we didn't have a ton of open-world-esque post-apocalyptic games. Now we see a ton of that. Rage 2 is separated a bit by its tone, its atmosphere, in my opinion, and also its overall gunplay. There just isn't an open world game that has the gunplay that Rage 2 has, but Rage 1 was more of a gritty, focused experience that actually wanted to try to tell you a story and establish itself, and while some will say it was just generic across the board, I would disagree with that. I thought the wing stick showed a lot of personality and that this game had a lot of creativity attached to it, you know, the RC car bomb, that type of stuff was a lot of fun, and actually you saw some elements carry over into Rage Rage 2 in the terms of planning. I, I thought that was pretty cool. But anyway, Rage 1, one of the better published Bethesda titles, not perfect by any means, but uh, still an enjoyable one. Red Guard, never played that. That game does not look good at all, and I think that's one of the Elder Scrolls games we all forget about. But next is Rogue Warrior meme status. Fucking meme status. Rogue Warrior is a goddamn joke. 
I played this game for an old series of mine, Humanity's Worst Games. By the way, the reason I don't do it anymore is because it's just unappealing for me to sit down and make content that I know I'm going to get pissed off about. Rogue Warrior is terrible, but in the funniest way. It actually might be worth a playthrough just for the laughs because some of the stupid dialogue. I mean, it blew my mind. It plays like shit. It runs like shit. It looks like shit. Everything about Rogue Warrior is shit. And this was the darkest times of the Bethesda publishing arm. I mean, this was when they were putting out games like A Demon's Forge, like Rogue Warrior. What else is on this list that they were popping out at that time? Um, I think that Brink was one of them as well. Uh, Call of Cthulhu, Pirates of the Caribbean, Ducati Moto. They were just like, yeah, whatever. Give us money. We don't care. And uh, yeah, so Rogue Warrior was the product of those de those decisions. He said at one point that one of the great leaders in North Korea had a tiny dick. Like, just weird shit. Really weird shit. Next, we have a plethora of Star Trek games. Legacy, Conquest, Encounters, Tactical, Assault, and guess what? Yep, I have never played any of these. In fact, I'm gonna... No, you know what? They're gonna go into... They published this? Because you know what? Four Star Trek games from Bethesda? What? I had no idea, man. So yeah, I have uh, never played them and I have no idea that they published them. So I got nothing else to say on that other than uh, Star Trek I was never really infatuated with. I, I preferred Star Wars, not like they're comparable, but I just, that was the star I leaned towards, I guess. Uh, not that I've never really given Star Trek a fair shake, it's just never looked appealing to me. Elder Scrolls Blades. Uh, yep, we're going to put you in the lowest of the low. I don't think it's meme status because underneath all of it, I think, is a good game. And like I said with Fallout Shelter, Bethesda has shown that they are a good mobile developer. However, Elder Scrolls Blades is a game that just falls woefully short of what it could have been. And it's because Bethesda got greedy. But like I said, underneath that, good gameplay systems uh, could be good rewards, but they just don't want to do that. They want to get your money. And then the shadow nerfing, just really nefarious shit that's happening in there. And that really bugged me. So yeah, man, I, I cannot rank this game high at all. It's not so awful that it's meme status or, or so hilariously bad that it's meme status. But I, I think that it is a C because there is a good game underneath all of it. And some people do enjoy it, I understand that. Um, and they just ignore some of the issues that happen with it. But for me, as someone who like fights for better games constantly and is like, no, Bethesda, you could have the money on top of making this game fair and not shadow nerfing shit. I, I think this game's a C and it should be avoided at all costs. Skyrim. Skyrim is an S tier. Uh, one of the best open world games made. Games still mimic Skyrim to this day. Um, I remember it also led the world in dungeon design where everything kind of looped back to the entrance. Uh, a, a really positive change that we'll see in the likes of Rage 2. If you've been playing that, you may have noticed that. Um, all started with Skyrim. Furthermore, I like the addition of the Dragonborn abilities. The DLC for Skyrim was... Mwah, I loved it to death. Skyrim was the beginning of Mr. Matty Plays himself. I did not grow at all until Skyrim happened and I started making rare weapon guides. It's actually how I truly... I fell in love with finding rare weapons and armor in Oblivion, but making guides and really hunting them down when I found out other people love them as much as I did, Skyrim was really where that originated from where i was like oh my god like people are on the same page as me i thought i was the only one cool and so yeah man i have always thoroughly enjoyed skyrim I, it's a game i've gone back to time and time again whether it was special edition on the ps4 on the switch playing it on the pc modding it on the pc playing it on the 360 uh we'll not talk about the ps3 version but skyrim is so fun it does lack the choice and consequence of role-playing elements maybe of morrowind and oblivion it trades off for a more streamlined gameplay system um, one that you're pretty much good at everything as you put time into it but man man skyrim is a timeless game that i can always go back to next is the evil within 2 c plus Evil Within 2 just lost identity completely. It tried to appeal to a massive crowd by just getting rid of anything that was good about the original. Um, it told a more concise story, but I really didn't care about Sebastian or his family. So at the end of the day, it just became an action adventure game with really crappy stealth mechanics. And so with a bad story tied to that, I don't care about the Evil Within 2. So let's move on from it and talk about the Evil Within 1, which I'm actually gonna put in the A tier. Yep, that's serious. Evil Within 1 was a good survival horror game, if anything. I don't care how nonsensical its story was. I couldn't tell you a thing about it right now, but I remember when playing it, I was able to follow what was going on. I didn't think it was so dastardly confusing that I was like lost completely. Um, 
but it's not why I played that game, and it's kind of one of my arguments for Rage too. Like the focus of The Evil Within and all of its design was put into making it a good survival horror game. And just like Rage 2, all of its design and focus was put into making it an excellent gameplay driven title. And so The Evil Within, in my view, achieved exactly what it set out to be, which was a great survival horror game. You know, Sebastian was just slow enough where, you know, the guy, what's the name of the guy with the chainsaw who would chase you around? He was like always right on your tail. I remember how intense it was. Uh, it just, Evil Within 1 is a game I actually want to go back to at some point in time. I, I thought that that was one of the better survival horror titles I've played. And there's very rarely a new survival horror game that comes out and, and does it well like The Evil Within has. Uh, it's usually you just got away from the next Resident Evil game. So I really embrace that Bethesda has put out an Evil Within game that, that successfully mimicked what is great about that genre and, and built off of it in some ways. Wet. One of the most undiscussed published Bethesda titles that needs more, it is an A. Slick, stylish gameplay, albeit a little short, about eight hours long, but wet is such a fun time. This may, for a lot of folks, go into this category here. They published it, but let me tell you, man, wet is one of the best published Bethesda titles, and it does come from them in a time where they were doing Hunted Demon's Forge, Rogue Warrior, get really bad published titles, and all of a sudden, wet comes out. It's actually really good. I cannot suggest it enough, man. It is worth a run through, even to this point in time. Wheel spin, what the hell is that? Stop that shit, Bethesda. What is wheel spin? What is with them publishing racing games and going, yep, yep, this will make us money? Because that's the thing, they're a business, right? And to end it all, we have the Wolfenstein trilogy, which is the New Order, New Colossus, and the Old Blood. Let's start off with the Old Blood. C+. Plus. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but when your main mechanic in your new expansion is going to be just a pipe, at the end of the day, it was just more Wolfenstein The New Order, which I adored, by the way. And it didn't feel like a worthy expansion. It felt like just cashing in on a, a, a surprise success for Bethesda and, and forcing more rather than naturally creating a, a fun amount of more, if that makes any sense whatsoever. But anyway, Wolfenstein The Old Blood was not crazy about, but what I was crazy about was Wolfenstein The New Order, which is absolutely S-tier. What a fucking awesome game, man. I mean, this is where first-person shooting story-driven games really took off because Wolfenstein, I mean, BJ Blazkowicz, he's a Nazi killing machine. He's never been a character you care about, but this game made you care about him, the people that surround him. Excellent job. Excellent job by Machine Games, man. They really understood Wolfenstein and, and captured it and made it easily the best Wolfenstein game yet. It's easily one of the best published Bethesda games. One I unapologetically recommend. Amazing story moments that I cannot spoil. Really shocking stuff happens. Meh. But then we are looking at Wolfenstein 2. And this one I'm going to put in a B+. Wolfenstein 2, I think it's a lot of shit because there was a ton of cutscenes, but I thought a lot of meaningful storytelling was packed into it. I thought there were some pretty shocking moments. Uh, I know a lot of people have broken it down for reasons X, Y, and Z. I think there was some political stuff tied to it. I don't know shit about that. I don't get political on my channel. I played it as a game, and what I got was a pretty enjoyable experience. I thought the hub was pretty crappy. I thought that the end game content was awful. I thought it ended way too soon, and so I do hope that they take note of all of that in Wolfenstein 3 and make a much better game. But what we have in Wolfenstein 2, I thought what was there was actually quite enjoyable. It just needed to be longer if they were going to add that many cutscenes, and I think they needed to take more inspiration from Wolfenstein A New Order. I think they took a lot of people's genuine surprise from this game and how they loved BJ, they loved the characters, and they wanted to give more of that and they still had when the gameplay was going excellent action in Wolfenstein 2 it just wasn't enough I also know a lot of people thought this game was considerably easier than New Order so that is most unfortunate but personally I enjoyed it enough to say it's a B plus it's a good game uh, I remember making a review for it after I finished it and saying like this is awesome you should play it and a lot of people were very strongly against it but some people did strongly agree with it so it's a divisive game but this, ladies and gentlemen, what you're looking at is the concluded list of my Bethesda published titles tier list. I'm pretty happy with the results. There are a lot of Bethesda titles that I have not played. I don't think I'm really missing out on much outside of the original Daggerfall Arena and maybe Battle Spire. Uh, Doom 2, you could always go back to it. I think I kind of experienced some of that with Doom 1. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video i know it was a really long one but i think that it was well overdue a lot of people have asked for this after i did it on stream so here it is ladies and gentlemen 
Be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Fire away, ladies and gentlemen. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. Those links are in the description down below, along with my Patreon. Do consider supporting that as it fuels all the content I create here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.